This is your inner state on the interstate. Welcome back to your inner state on the interstate. This is episode number eight, which is about exploring the dream world. Ooh. So this is going to be another two-part series. Today, we're going to talk about dreams, working with dreams and dream interpretation, and how we can make the bridge between both the waking world and the dream world. So given the fact that we sleep, what, an average of six to eight hours every night, that that's a quarter to a third of our lives that we spend sleeping. And how much do we really know about what happens when we sleep? And how much do we really consider what happens for us? And where do we go? Where is our mind? What happens in the dream world? I've always been curious and, and fascinated by sleep. And when I lived in Japan, I had purchased a camcorder which had night vision. And I basically was doing my own little sleep studies with myself. So I would record myself overnight, all night long, to just see what happened. What did it look like? How did I move? And I found it really fascinating to see the movement that I had and also to hear and see myself when I was sleep talking because I used to do that a lot. Honestly, it's a really strange experience because we never really see ourselves sleeping in action. And I have to say it's a really strange experience when you do see yourself in this unconscious state for a long period of time. And some of us might have photos that other people took of us while we're sleeping, but have you ever really seen a video of yourself sleeping? It's really strange. And it really makes you wonder, like, what is happening back there? What's happening behind the scenes? And there's so much vulnerability. It's like we're completely unconscious for that period of time. So let's talk about dream world. So personally, I love dreaming. I like interpreting other people's dreams and helping them to find out what it really means for them. So how do you work with dreams and interpret them? It's a good question. So for me, it's really about tapping into the subconscious or the unconscious mind and what is already there. And it's about understanding that the way that our brain interprets dreams, real experiences, imagination, memories, it all gets recalled from the same place when we're thinking about it. In a way, our brains don't really know the difference between our dream world life, our waking world life, our daydreaming imagination life, and memories, because they all essentially get stored in the same place. I find that tapping into our dreams can be a way, a tool to tap into our subconscious mind. And if we realize that we have an emotional reaction to things in waking life, it can be the same thing in our sleeping life. Like those same trigger points, they come up because there's some unresolved places in our minds and basically our brains and our minds are trying to problem solve even in our sleep. It's trying to sort things out and make sense of things and also brings up maybe some unresolved things in our lives that in our day to day we might push it away. But sometimes we wake up from a dream and we're like, wow, what, what was that about? What was that theme? Why was that? Why did that feel so real? And when you wake up and you still have those emotions lingering from the dream, you know, like if something like embarrassing or shameful happens where, you know, you're, you're giving a presentation and suddenly you realize that you're naked or your teeth are falling out or things like that. These are all useful clues to show us what's really happening subconsciously. It shows us where we're holding on to shame, fear, anger, emotions that we don't necessarily intentionally go to. So in order to work with your dreams, you have to better remember your dreams, right? So I'm going to share a few ways that you can better remember your dreams. One simple way is keeping a dream journal. Some people use a paper journal where you just have a dedicated journal that's just for your dreams and you have it by your bed so that as soon as you wake up, you write things down. Or if you wake up in the middle of the night, depending on your sleep patterns and habits, 
you can just jot it down in bed. In the past, I used to have a dream journal, but nowadays what I find is that I just use a simple note-taking app in my phone so that I don't even have to get up. I don't even have to reach over to use a pen and paper and to write words legibly. I actually just type in my phone while I'm still lying down and I do my best to to stay in that sort of half asleep state so that I can keep connecting with the dreams a little bit longer. And what you can do is just whatever scenes are in your head, keep them in your mind, keep kind of replaying them, whether it's a character or it's a place or it's a particular object or an incident, just keep that in your mind, keep it cycling in your mind. And as soon as you can, just jot down the keywords that you can remember in that moment. And what I do is the first time around, I'll just write, I'll just do like a brain dump of all the keywords that I can think about, the places, the people, the feelings. I don't try to go too much into trying to make sense of it or to make it make sense to anybody else or even to myself. I just write the words down. And it's just so that I can get the, the widest sort of spread of all the things that I can remember. And then the next time around, once I've done that, then I can kind of connect the threads, connect those keywords and make more sort of stories out of them so that I can remember what they were. And for me, even having just a few keywords or a few key phrases later in the day, if I happen to look at my notes and I'll see it, then I can recall the whole scenery much more easily. And this takes practice. If you haven't been in practice where you've been keeping a dream journal or you remember your dreams easily, you know, some people say that they don't remember the dreams at all. I believe everybody has the ability to, it just takes some practice. You can also do things to expand that time in the in-between state, you know, lay in bed a little bit longer. Don't just immediately rush and jump into what it is that you have to do for the day. Even if you can let yourself stay in bed another minute or two, to just feel, to just allow yourself to transition between the waking world and the sleep world, that can be helpful because what it's telling your brain in a way is that that's also a priority, that what was on your mind while you were asleep is also important to give it that space. And the same thing when you're falling asleep, I'm going to put more resources and links on the blog post that goes along with this episode on your inner state.love. So another way that you can expand that space in between sleep and waking is you can allow yourself when you're falling asleep to be more conscious, to just be present, be aware of that space that you're transitioning in, and to kind of extend it. Yoga Nidra, which is one of my favorite practices, and I have a meditation of a Yoga Nidra body scan up on my YouTube channel, which is your inner state. And with practices like that, with yoga nidra, it's called the yogic sleep. And it, it's all about tapping into that space that's in between the waking and the sleep. Then we have all of this access to the information that happens to us when we're sleeping. A lot of this practice is creating more of a bridge between these two worlds, between the waking and the sleeping world. And it takes practice. And along with some of these tips that I'm giving here, I'm going to put a whole list of different tips and resources and other websites you can go to if you really want to expand your ability to bridge the two different worlds. There is an app which is actually helpful for people to record them talking in their sleep. So it will, you leave it on all night. And when you do talk, it records just those snippets. So someone suggested to me that you can have that. And if it's in the middle of the night or when you do wake up, that you can just start talking and you can just say out loud what you can recall from your dream. And that's one way of recording it as well. Now let's jump into interpreting dreams. I personally love, love, love interpreting dreams. I find it really fun, but I also enjoy really good metaphors. So Often people will ask me about what their dreams mean. And of course, there is sort of traditional symbology and dream dictionaries and encyclopedias where certain symbols mean specific things. It's much more than that. It's about the meaning and the feeling that every single person has in their own dream. And just because you have 
a particular person, like an ex or a family member in your dream, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily specifically about them, but more, I'd like to ask people, what does that person symbolize to you? What do they represent for you? And then how is that relevant to the action that happened in the dream? Okay, so let me give an example. I just opened up my app, my notes app to a dream. And by the way, I write my dreams every single morning. And if you do that every single day and you remember to do that and take the time over time, you just get better and better at it. So when I open up my notes app and I see the notes of a dream that I had two days ago, I see some keywords here. First is singing. He held me. It made me sing and flow. It was amazing to feel the song being sung through me. I knew this song. And then I also have a note that says Corgi on phone wires. <laughs> and so just with those, some, some of those keywords and phrases, I can remember. If I hadn't written this down, there's no way. There's no way I would have remembered at all any of these images from a dream that was two days ago. But as I see these notes now, I, get, I can get the full image of what it was. And more importantly, I can get to the feeling of, for example, the singing. There was this part in the dream where there was some man and he was holding me up, like lifting me up. And I just started singing the song. And it was a song which was like vaguely familiar. And it was such a beautiful experience in the dream because I could feel what it felt for me to fully sing the song holding back nothing, knowing the words, knowing and feeling like those words, the lyrics, the melody came from somewhere else, feeling the fullness of the song being sung through me. How do I interpret that? It's about the feeling. And for me, the feeling was about feeling complete, about feeling whole, about feeling like I'm utilizing my full potential by using my creative talents I've had a desire to connect with music more and it could be about that. But to me, even more significant is the feeling that I had in the dream because the feeling was fully embodying my voice, not the music part, but the feeling of being so aligned with my purpose that I know exactly what to say and how to say it. It was that feeling because to me that points back to what's more important to me, which is about being aligned with my purpose in life. What that specific dream was about for me was about embodying the fullness of that truth that's coming through my voice. And that inspired me to actually write out this whole podcast episode. This whole podcast series has been through inspiration. I have not known, I have not planned ahead of time what each episode is going to be about, but rather I allow it to come through me. I allow the message that needs to be said to come through me. And in this case, this is all about dreams and dream interpretation. And of course, the message of what this podcast episode was going to be about came to me in a dream. My biggest tip for dream interpretation for yourself or for others is to really get to the exact feeling, the emotions in the dream. Those are going to be the keys to let you know what's important and what it's really about and what is it trying to tell you? What are you trying to tell yourself through dreaming? What do these characters, what do these objects, what do these places mean to you? For example, if you dream of a place that was familiar to you when you were younger, like your childhood home, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to go visit that home or your elementary school classroom, but what do those places represent for you? What emotions are associated with there? Was it a safe place or was it a place that didn't feel conducive to learning and where you felt a lot of shame. You know, everyone has their own interpretation of what it means for them. And the important thing is to connect with what are those feelings and what are those feelings trying to tell you now? How is it relevant to you now? Perhaps, again, if you had a, a safe place, a safe room in your childhood home, is there something about that that you need to cultivate in your life now? Is there something about that feeling that you long for, that you miss. So yeah, don't take those dreams just for face value. Even sexual encounters and dreams don't have to be about physical sex. It can be about creativity or connection or collaboration. And again, the people themselves probably represent something to you. All of the people in our lives represent aspects of ourselves. Some people we're drawn to or admire because we don't believe that we have those qualities. 
And then there are also people or qualities of people that we reject because those are aspects of our shadow side that we don't want to accept as part of ourselves either. So whatever it is that's happening in your dream with different people or characters, they can give you clues to what within your mind are you drawn to? Do you need more of? Do you need to integrate into your mind and accept that that's part of you? Or what in your mind are you pushing away and rejecting that you need to accept also as part of you? So if you have a dream that bothered you or had some disturbing or shameful parts to it, just watch your reaction. Because if we can, we can just witness what it was that we saw without judgment, then we're actually opening the doors to seeing what those things are really about. We can see those aspects of ourselves that we're denying in our conscious mind and allow it to come to the surface. And so now we're going to talk about lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming is when in the dream, you realize that you're dreaming. And personally, I do it a lot. One of the things that I used to do is when I realized that I was dreaming, I would test myself and see if I could fly. And if I was able to fly, then I knew that I had control over my dreams. And then I would take it from there and do whatever ridiculous thing was next on my agenda. The way that I see lucid dreaming is, again, it's like creating more of that bridge that bridges the sleep world with the waking world, the unconscious mind with the conscious mind. And the more that we can be conscious while in this unconscious state, the better opportunity that we have to be conscious in our waking state as well. Because so much of our lives are actually coming from unconscious programming. So much of our lives, our reactions to things, are unconscious. We just do it. We just say things sometimes and we don't even realize why we're saying it or where it's coming from. Practicing lucid dreaming can be really helpful to be able to bring more consciousness, both in the sleeping world and in the waking world. If expanding into dream world is about being able to be in touch with our dreams, it's also being able to play with our imaginations, our daydreams as well. So I wanted to share something called the cube game which I was introduced to over 10 years ago. And since then, I've done it with many people. So it's basically just an imagination game. And I'm going to guide you through it right now. So it's going to take a few minutes. So you need to have a few minutes spared to be able to do this. And at the end, I'll tell you more information about what all of this is about. So for now, just enjoy and have fun imagining and let your creativity shine. So the first thing is you're going to get comfortable, close your eyes. You can take some deep breaths if you'd like. So first, you're going to imagine a desert scene. Just notice what the scene looks like. What does the sky look like? What does the landscape look like? Is it close or is it far away? Is it colorful? or not. And how does it feel when you look at this landscape? Now visualize that there's a cube in the middle of this desert. And ask yourself, how big is it? Is it the size of you? Is it smaller than you? The size of a building? Remember, this is your imagination. And get a nice, good visual image of this cube. Is it on the solid ground? Is it floating? What material is it made out of? Is it solid? Is it transparent? And how do you feel about it? You can also ask, what color is it? What's the texture of it? How does it feel if you touch it? What's the inside made of? Ask yourself all these details. And then next, there's a ladder. Again, your imagination. The ladder can be anywhere. 
and I'll ask, how many rungs does the ladder have? Is it a few? Is it like 20? What is the ladder made of? Anything else? Is the ladder close to the cube? Is it touching it or is it separate? And how does it make you feel when you look at it? And next, there comes a storm. Again, this is your imagination, so the storm can look like anything. So once you have a good visual of that, I'll ask a few questions. Is it far away? Is it close? Is it already storming? And what does it feel like? What does the storm feel like? Do you feel afraid seeing it? Does it feel like a relief? Does it feel exciting? Just notice it. And now there's a horse. And just notice where is the horse in relation to all these things? How does this horse feel? Does it have a personality? What color is it? How do you feel about the horse? And then in this scene, there's a flower. Notice where it is in relation to all the other items in relation to the cube and the ladder and the horse. What color is it? Does it have a lot of petals? Is it a single flower or is it many? And how does it make you feel? And so that's the end of the cube game. So firstly, how do you feel after imagining? Was it fun? I think it's just fun to sit and imagine for a little bit. But there's another step to this if you don't know it already, which is that each of these items are meant to symbolize something in your life. The desert scene is supposed to represent life and how you perceive life. When I've done this many times, and so sometimes people have a desert which is really colorful and inviting. And for others, it's barren, <laughs> boring. <laughs> so what, what did your desert look like? What did it feel like to you? And the cube is supposed to be about yourself, your identity of yourself, your ego. And I've seen people who have tiny cubes, cubes that fit in the palm of your hand, or cubes that are huge. I've seen cubes that are floating, cubes that are transparent and clear, some that are hard on the outside and soft on the inside. And they always match perfectly the person, how a person feels about themselves. And then the ladder, the ladder represents close friends, close friends and family, really. I've seen ladders where there are like three rungs, just a few, and where they're separate from the cube, just in its own place, just standing up on its own. And then there are some where it's leaning up against the cube, or some that are that might have like 30 rungs, 60 rungs, that just straight up shoot up straight into the sky. When I ask about the feeling, it's always indicative of how people feel about friends. You know, some people like to have their friends close and have friends who are independent, who can stand on their own. And the number of rungs is also supposed to represent the number of close friends, people that 
you consider in your inner circle. And then the storm is about conflict. How do you relate to conflict in your life? Do you like to have the storm at a distance? Like you deal with things before any conflict arises or you avoid conflict. Some people like conflict. Some people get a thrill out of it. It's exciting. Or there's, there's a lot of relief, tension release in having conflict. So depending on your storm, how it looks like and how it feels like, that's your relationship with conflict. And then there's the horse, which is related to your ideal partner. The colors are supposed to represent certain things, white with purity, black, mysterious, brown is stable, grounded, and last is the flower, which is supposed to represent either children or projects. So I hope that that was a fun exercise. And the point of it is to connect, to make these connections between what your subconscious mind shows you and how that's related to your conscious experience. Because even though this was imagination, in a way it's not that different from, from a dream. I mean, just by saying a horse, you create this image in your mind of what a horse looks like or what this horse in this scene looks like. And realizing that there are just ways that we can allow ourselves to connect more with our unconscious mind, it can actually be a really fun experience. So to me, that's kind of why I enjoy dreaming so much and I enjoy the process of dream interpretation. So I hope you enjoyed this episode about the dream world. I'd love to hear any stories or interesting dreams that you guys have had or what the cube game might have shown you. So that is all for today. Thanks so much for joining and stay tuned for part two, which is a continuation about dreams, but this is more about dreams and manifestation. Thank you so much and bye for now. Thanks for listening to Your Inner State on the Interstate. For more information, visit yourinnerstate.love.